Coming up next on Arizona Horizon, support for Medicaid expansion is growing. We'll hear more in our weekly legislative update with the Arizona Capital Times. And Congressman Ed Pastor will join us to discuss immigration reform, sequestration, and other issues. Those stories next on Arizona Horizon. Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to Arizona Horizon. I'm Ted Simons. Arizona home prices increased 18.6% in February. That's compared to a nationwide increase of just over 10%. Arizona ranks second to Nevada in home price gains, with Phoenix showing the highest increases among cities, followed by Los Angeles, Riverside, Atlanta, and New York. The numbers come from a report by CoreLogic, a real estate data provider. And Department of Homeland Security Secretary Janet Napolitano Palatano was planning to visit Arizona's border with Mexico on Friday. Palatano is planning to travel to Tucson and Douglas, accompanied by the National Drug Control Policy Director and the Acting Commissioner of Customs and Border Control. They will visit, uh, visit, I should say, will include a meeting with local law enforcement and inspections of border security operations. Four Arizona counties are now supporting the governor's call to expand Medicaid. Here to talk about that and more in our weekly legislative update is is Luigi Del Puerto of the Arizona Capital Times. Luigi, good to see you again. Before we get now to these, uh, these counties that are deciding that they're going to jump on board this plan, the Department of Veterans Services Director resigned today, but there's much more to the story. Tell us. There's much more to the story. Uh, Joey Strickland, who's been appointed to this position since 2008, uh, resigned today following comments by somebody that he was hiring, uh, a former lawmaker from Tucson named Terry Proud, uh, that she, that Miss Proud had made to a, uh, the, the Arizona Daily Star. And essentially what she said was that she's not certain uh, whether women should be in the front lines uh, because of what they would, what they have, what they have to deal with uh, physiologically on on a monthly basis. Um, in addition to that, the governor's office had actually warned this director specifically not to hire Miss Pr Miss Proud about a year ago, and when he contravened the governor's wishes and these remarks came out, well, I could imagine that didn't sit well with the governor, and eventually. He resigned. So basically, she makes these statements, these impolitic statements at best here. Um, the governor's office eventually says, let's, let's not use this person, thank you. He uses this person, thank you, and all of a sudden now he's resigning. Yeah, I, I, you know, sometimes when there's too much pressure, you're given a choice of just uh, uh, you know, handing yeah. over your resignation letter. I'm presuming that's what happened here. Now, is, is Terry proud? Was she actually hired or was she in the process of being hired? No, she said that uh, they had uh, offered her the job already and the department had rescinded rescinded the offer as okay. well. Okay, all right. Interesting stuff there. I'm sure there's more uh, to be found here as we go on. Um, interesting as well that these four counties in Arizona, uh, what are these board of su boards of supervisors, and they're all getting together now saying, we want Medicaid expansion. As you know, the governor has been trying to reach out to as many folks as she can to get them to rally behind her proposal to expand Medicaid. Uh, she wasn't very successful when it comes to, when it came to the grassroots of her party, but when it came to county government, it seems like she is encountering a lot of success there. So four um, uh, boards of supervisors in rural Arizona have in the last few days come up with, uh, with a uh, resolution uh, essentially supporting the governor's uh, expansion proposal. Now, from their point of view, the expansion is a good thing because they, the counties, have been suffering as a result of increases in their costs to uh, provide mental health services. Um, and this is a bit technical, but uh, they have been taking on prisoners that have mental health problems, and they have had to provide for them. Now, they are assuming that these folks uh, were among those who were let go or could not enroll in Medicaid uh, as a result of the enrollment freeze that happened uh, two years ago. And they're saying maybe we would not be seeing them in our criminal justice system uh, if, they, if, you know, if we have Medicaid 
uh, if the, the freeze didn't have, happen, and if we are going to expand Medicaid, then probably we wouldn't see these, these people uh, committing these crimes. I, I thought it was interesting, uh, Sheila Polk at Yavapai County, I think Yavapai County was the first uh, board that uh, went ahead and uh, passed this resolution. She did bring up law and order, that they're having, the criminal justice system is being flooded by folks who aren't being covered for mental health services. I, I just spoke with her uh, b this afternoon, and to her, this is not just a fiscal issue, this is a uh, public safety issue, m uh, more specifically, an issue for her community. She said that they have been seeing her office has been seeing criminal cases involving um, childish adults, you know, single uh, individuals uh, who are committing erratic, violent behavior. Mm -hmm. And now that they have come on to the system, they are finding out that they have mental health problems. I noticed that uh, uh, Speaker Tobin's district is among the, uh, the, the, city, the counties where this was passed. Is that uh, going to have any influence there? I have no doubt that, that this effort is being undertaken by the governor's office. It's uh, uh, specifically to try and encourage or pressure yeah. uh, uh, lawmakers to support the governor's plan. It, uh, also, one of the counties that did, in fact, uh, uh, approve this resolution is Mojave County, which, as you know, is probably the most conservative mm -hmm. uh, enclave in the state. Was that, that was the one. I, I think the others were unanimous. That one was not unanimous. This one was not. Yeah. All right. Well, so we'll see where that one goes as well. Uh, real quickly, before you go, there was... A gun bill that was passed, and yet Democrats, I think, tried to use the opportunity to, to, to get at least issues heard uh, regarding high-capacity magazines and, uh, and universal background checks. What happened here? Well, as you know, the Democrats had uh, proposed a series of bills that deal with school safety and gun control. Uh, those bills have not gotten anywhere. Uh, Gallardo, from Senator Steve Gallardo, exam for example, uh, a, a, a Democrat from Phoenix, had proposed a host of measures, and he's done this several times, and his proposals were all uh, parked in the Senate Rules Committee and never heard. And so they took the occasion um, to offer these bills. And I, I, I think it's very clear to them that none of them would pass, but they wanted to talk about the, the proposals, and, and they had a debate. Did they, did they have a debate? Were, were they talked about, or was it just quickly shut? It sounded to me like uh, nothing much was debated, and then the whole thing was shut down. Uh, he was able to actually offer his amendments, but uh, at the end of the debate, there's a procedural um, a stage where they would have to adopt what's called a committee of the whole report, and, and they were shut down at that point, but um, they were able to present their ideas. Is that an indication, uh, one way or the other, of how things are going? Uh, are folks getting a little testy down there? I mean, is it still, everyone's still kind of waiting for some big shoes to drop? What's the, what's the mood at? Well, right now, things have really slowed down, um, not necessarily to a trickle, but not a lot of things are going on. Um, this is the one thing that I think will come up at one point during the session. I mean, Democrats want this debate. Uh, I think Senator Gallardo is prepared, if not you know, this week, then at some point in the future, when he sees a gun bill that he can amend, then he's, he's going to try and amend it. But uh, it would not, you know, in this um, next few days, when we're not seeing too much debate, when they're not seeing, we're, uh, we're not, they're not passing too many bills, for mm -hmm. example, I would not, um, I would, I would say we would probably see a whole lot of bills getting revived, a whole lot of shenanigans going on, and probably pe people just getting either bored uh, that, that they're not doing a whole lot of things. And the governor can afford to just sit there and wait until they get their Medicaid expansion and budget in line. That's the big stick that she has. That she does indeed. All right, Luigi, good stuff. We'll keep an eye on that Department of Veteran Services director job as well. It's an interesting story. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.
Arizona Representative Ed Pastor has been in Congress since 1991 when he won a special election to replace an ailing Mo Udall. Pastor represents Arizona's 4th Congressional District, which covers downtown Phoenix, along with the city's southern and western areas and a part of Glendale as well. Joining us now is... Congressman Ed Pastor. It's good to see you again. Good to see Thanks you. for joining us. Well, thank you for the invitation. You bet. Good to have you here. There's so much to talk about, but we just we just kind of mentioned uh, with Luigi Del Puerto of the Arizona Capital Times what's going on in the state regarding right. Medicaid expansion. Right. Mm -hmm. Some of the rural counties are mm -hmm. now saying, right. hey, listen, uh, this is not such a bad deal. What are your thoughts when you hear this kind of well, thing? Well, uh, for the last couple of years, I've been working with a number of hospitals, and they've been trying to get and have gotten waivers. Uh, for example, uh, Phoenix Children's Hospital. Uh, help them get a waiver from uh, CMS, which does the uh, Medicaid. And th they needed these waivers because uh, if you don't have a population to serve that can be, that pays, and since in this case the federal government, then uh, you'll quickly go broke. And so uh, the city of Phoenix is working with some other hospitals uh, to try to get them over the bridge to 2014. If we don't expand Medicaid, especially in the rural areas, What's going to happen is that the service providers are going to go belly up. It's that simple. You, you say that, and yet we've had lawmaker after lawmaker, the conservative lawmakers on here saying, you know what, these hospitals are making money hand over foot. They can afford to take on these, these costs. Are they wrong? They're wrong. They're wrong because right now, my experience for the last two years has been that these hospitals, and I'm talking about the major hospitals as well as the rural hospitals, are hemorrhaging because if, if they're, they're seeing patients because of the humaneness of it and they're not getting paid. And, and now these patients, they could see and be reimbursed with Medicaid money. And that's why I think the governor has, has made it an economic issue as well as a humane issue. And that's why I'm very supportive. And that's why the rural counties are passing these resolutions. So, so you would agree that there, was, there were options there, but there was really no choice? There was really no choice. Okay, let's get on to issues of, uh, of, of national concern and, of course, here in Arizona as well. We'll start with immigration reform. Okay. Um, the ideas that are out there, I know the gang of eight U.S. senators have their ideas, and we could talk about that. Is there something coming from the House as well? I, I hear rumblings that something might be happening. Well, the answer is yes. Uh, we have our group of nine or group of eight uh, and they've been working also at uh, immigration. You have conservative uh, members like uh, Sam Johnson from Texas, who's been active, as well as Luis Gutierrez, who's been a champion of immigration. But it's going to be interesting with the dynamics. Uh, the Senate right now, the uh, Gang of Eight, has been working. And I think the administration has said, uh, let's see what the Senate is going to be able to do. And so the expectation is that the bipartisan bill will come out of the Senate, passes the Senate with uh, bipartisan support, comes to the House. Now the question is, uh, will the House bill have bipartisan support or will it begin to muck up the whole legislative process? What do you think is going to happen? Well, I, I don't know. That, that's up to uh, the Speaker and the leadership because we have been successful in passing major legislation this year, from the fiscal cliff to the continuing resolution to the domestic violence bill. The Senate has passed the bill. It comes to the House. The uh, Speaker, uh, John Boehner, has said that uh, the Republican caucus can present their bill, and if it doesn't pass, then the Senate bill will be on the floor. And so we have been successful in passing bipartisan legislation by this process. And that's the expectation with the immigration uh, uh, bill, that Senate bill comes to the House and it'll be passed in a bipartisan manner. Regarding that Senate bill, I want to get some of your thoughts here. Uh, securing the border is uh, uh, in there. It's always in there. It's always being discussed. And I always ask the question, what does that mean? Well, it means, uh, I think they've changed the word now to effective enforcement. I think now we're talking about effective enforcement because we talk about the, the Yuma sector, the Tucson Hector sector. In Yuma, we're able to uh, have better enforcement and we're able to apprehend people as they're coming over as compared to the Tucson sectors. Now we're talking about, uh, the question is, first of all, uh, what, what are the benchmarks? Uh, what is the benchmark? Uh, and uh, how are you going to measure when you reach the benchmark? And then who's going to measure? 
So I think that that has been one of the hardest uh, in the negotiation to get consensus on what it means by border security or effective law enforcement. And I think getting to the benchmark and also what are the uh, parameters that they're having problems uh, getting to. What would you like to see as far as benchmarks and parameters? Well, for me, I think today uh, with the number of crossings and the apprehensions that we're pretty much where we should be, uh, in, but it's never enough. I mean, some people want zero tolerance and other people would expect more. But I think today with the uh, te uh, technology we have on the border, the, the number of people we have in the border, uh, the people that are, that are crossing are probably into the drug smuggling, not, not the human, that uh, I think today we probably have a fairly secure border. So if, if a secure border were one of the mandates here, you would say, hey, I think we're there right now. I think, I think we're there, yeah, yeah. If we're not there, we're pretty close to there. Are we pretty close in terms of employee verification? Because I know that's part of the Senate plan as well. Well, I, I think we still need to work with it because there have been problems in the past in terms of just glitches. Uh, as you know, one of the biggest problems in the federal government is being able to have uh, IT uh, ability, and so they've always had glitches in terms of, uh, but it's something that's going to be needed, and so uh, we just need to work at it and, and make it make it a better system. The idea of admitting new workers only when Americans can't be found. Uh, again, what does that mean? How viable is something like that? And well, do you agree with that idea? Well, I, uh, if you want to secure the border, uh, you're going to need to have workers come across the border and know where they're at and who they're working for. That's the reality. And the reality is that this country is going to need foreign workers. Uh, the AFL-CIO and the uh, U.S. Chamber of Commerce have reached some agreement. But I, 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 uh, I hope that they relook at the number of visas that they're going to be giving out. Uh, you have the agriculture visas as well as the high-skill visas. But in between, you need construction, you need hospitality, you need other, other skills. Now, I'm told that the construction is capped at 15,000. In Arizona today, the housing market is developing, and it could be going a lot quicker. What is the problem people are, are, are encountering is the lack, the lack of labor force. So 15000 may be too small of a cap. There's also apparently a dispute over wages for lower-skilled workers. Um, it, the business community and, and Republicans are saying, you know, let's – cap it at a certain point, uh, Democrats, unions saying, no, fewer workers but higher wages. Where do you stand on well, that? Well, I, I think that, that any time you have a, a person uh, working, that they should get a livable wage and have some protections in terms that they uh, can organize if, if, uh, and, and, and stop any abuses. So I, I think that those are uh, conditions that we need to, to consider because you don't want the uh, the livable wage to go down just because you're using foreign workers. Is that something, is that sticking point something that you think could, could as you mentioned earlier, muck up the whole works? Well, it, it might, but I think, I think that, as I understand what has happened between the AFL-CIO and the Chamber of Commerce, that they're talking about livable wages and that the workers have some protective uh, rights with them. Uh, last question on immigration, and I, I, in reading up on this, I noticed that there were some Latino activists who aren't happy with you. They say that you haven't been a, 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 to the front enough and vocal enough on comprehensive immigration reform. How do you respond to that? Well, I've been at this uh, almost 10, 12 years. Uh, I have stood with the, uh, the DREAM Act. I voted for the DREAM Act. I've been dealing with uh, comprehensive immigration. Uh, so in terms of working with members of Congress, uh, I've worked with a number of members of Congress. And so uh, I'm more effective. In, in, in terms, I, you probably won't see me at a lot of press conferences and, and stuff like that because for me, I, I don't think that that's uh, where I can be more effective. I th for me, being more effective is helping the students with their DACA applications, stopping deportations, and trying to get votes to pass the immigration bill. All right. Uh, let's move on to sequestration and the impact on your district and on Arizona and the country. Uh, w w What's going on back there? What's happening here? Well, I, I had the same question because uh, my belief was that uh, no one was against sequestration, that nobody wanted it, uh, neither party wanted it, the administration didn't want it. And we've had two or three uh, opportunities to uh, stop sequestration, but uh, we haven't done it. The most recent experience was a contained resolution. Our expectation, or at least my expectation, was that either the administration was going to come out and say, let's do something about sequestration, 
that either one of the parties in, in the Senate or in the House was going to do something. But uh, we kept sequestration and we just gave the agencies a little, bo little more flexibility in determining how those monies were going to be cut. As far as that flexibility is concerned, and Eric, let's talk transportation projects. I know you're big on transportation. Right. Um, funding for light rail, funding for some of the bigger projects in Arizona, just all comes to a screeching halt? What's going on? No, no, on? no, it won't come to a screeching halt because uh, you still have monies in, in the pipeline. It just means that there's less money. Uh, here in Arizona, we have contracts with the federal government for the light rail expansion. So uh, the ones that are going to have a hard time are what we call new starts. If your particular city does not have a light rail project right now, now you're going to have a very difficult time. For us, at least we're building and we're progressing, expanding, and so we have uh, an agreement already that uh, allows us to go back and use those monies as we as we uh, raise the money that were matched by the federal dollars. What else do we watch out for? I know the aerospace industry, defense, uh, just major hits here in Arizona, and the hits will keep on coming until something's done here. Uh, what do we watch out for? What are you concerned about? Well, uh, one is basically uh, in defense, but defense was, was one of the uh, agencies in this continuing resolution to have greater flexibility. So mm -hmm. now uh, the Defense Department is going to have the ability to decide where they're going to be and what uh, systems they want to keep uh, and, and, and make those decisions. Uh, I think what we're dealing with right now is in Arizona is to get the uh, testing sites for uh, the drones. That's still on the table. And so there's, there's other opportunities that are still there that we need to seek out and, and try to get. Is this going to be a, a death by a thousand cuts kind of thing? Is, is anyone going to step up and say enough is enough? What, what? Well, the, the next uh, possible uh, effort is going to be uh, when we do the budget, budget resolution. Uh, the Senate has their budget, the House has their budget. There will be a, a conference and hopefully during those negotiations that one of the determinations will be how are we going to do uh, the next deal in, in, in determination of the budget so that we'll meet the sequestration requirements at the same time fully fund whatever programs we want to fund. I uh, can't let you go without talking about gun control. The president's out sure. there as we speak, uh, uh, trying to get his uh, points across and his positions. Where do you stand regarding gun control, especially in light of some of the horrific stories we've seen here of late? What are your thoughts? Well, in 1994, I, I voted for the ban on assault weapons. And so uh, I started in 94 believing that uh, the Second Amendment uh, has reasonable limitations, like any other. Uh, an amendment. Uh, Bill of Rights uh, has the amendments and has our rights, but all the rights have reasonable limitation. Uh, you can't, you know, fire in an uh, auditorium, and so all of them have reasonable limitations. And I believe that assault weapons should be left with law enforcement and the military, that magazines of high capacity, uh, that we should restrict them, and I believe that we ought to have universal uh, uh, background checks. I think th those are reasonable limitations on the Second Amendment. I've seen national polls of variety showing up to and even above 90 percent approval for universal background checks, and yet uh, we're not seeing that out of Congress. What's going on back there? NRA. Just that's it. That's it. The NRA. And until uh, the basically, NRA well, because it basically basically says I've supported you in a number of, of uh, campaigns, and if you live in a district that's uh, solid Democrat or solid Republican, if you're not with us 100%, then you're going to get a primary challenge. And you think that even with these kind of, I mean, man, can 90% approval, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty overwhelming. That's a mandate right there. Even with that mandate, you think some, some folks back in Washington not willing to budge? Well, I, I, I believe they're going to listen to their, their NRA handler and, and look at the, uh, the scorecard that NRA uh, keeps on them, and, and uh, they're going to hear with those words. If you're not 100%, you're going to have a primary. And so uh, in those cases, then uh, guess what? You don't want to have a primary, and uh, you can talk to your constituent and say, well, I was with you as far as I could. Yeah. <laughs> so, so what you're basically saying is things are changing back there, but they're not changing all that much. You got that right. All right. It's always a pleasure to see you. Thank you so you much for joining us. Yeah, we thank appreciate you. It. Have a good day. And that is it for now. I'm Ted Simons. Thank you so much for joining us. You have a great evening.
Arizona Horizon is made possible by contributions from the Friends of Eight, members of your Arizona PBS station. Thank you.